Historians will note this hour at the White House. In a Rose Garden ceremony, a 58-year-old great-grandson of a slave is nominated by President Johnson to be a Supreme Court Justice. He is Solicitor General Thurgood Marshall, acknowledged the best-known Negro lawyer of the century. The President also calls his nominee best qualified. I have just talked to the Chief Justice and informed him that I shall send to the Senate this afternoon the nomination of Mr. Thurgood Marshall, Solicitor General, to the position of Associate Justice Supreme Court made vacant by the resignation of Justice Tom C. Clark of Texas. Thus, the highest court in the land, with the vacancy owing to the stepping down of Justice Clark, has named to its august body Thurgood Marshall, the first of his race so honored. Thurgood Marshall's work as a lawyer and a Supreme Court justice impacted the way discrimination was recognized in the legal system, but also leading to the empowerment and increased rights of many individuals. All the work that Marshall did in the Supreme Court to give a voice to those who were consistently overlooked started with his work as a civil rights lawyer. As a young boy, Marshall got into a lot of trouble, and as a punishment, he was forced to memorize the U.S. Constitution. This is where he contribu contributes his early love for law. Marshall went to an all-black institution, Howard Law School, where he met his mentor, Charles Houston, the man who he would fight many of his early cases with. It was Houston, Marshall, and the NAACP who together would dismantle the discriminatory legal segregation that still plagued many African Americans. Marshall's first big civil rights case with the NAACP was Murray v. Pearson, where he fought for Donald Murray, who was denied entrance to the University of Maryland based on race. Marshall was also denied acceptance to the University of Maryland based on race just early, years earlier, making this case very personal for Marshall. And what would be the first win in a long string of cases designed to undermine the legal basis of racial discrimination. Some of Marshall's other important civil rights cases were Shelley v. Allwright, which stated that all white primaries were unconstitutional, as well as Shelley v. Crane, which stated that racial restrictive covenant or redlining was also unconstitutional. But the civil rights case that Marshall is most well known for is Brown v. Board of Education. In this case, Marshall fought against the charge of separate but equal, which was upheld in the 1896 Supreme Court ruling Plessy v. Ferguson. Marshall was able to argue that separate was not equal based on the 14th Amendment leading to the desegregation of schools. Brown v. Board was one of the most important rulings for African Americans during the civil rights movement because it broke up the system of racism that was consuming American policy. As education attorney Daryl Wynn has said on the significance of Brown, here was the highest court in the land essentially saying that something was wrong with how the black Americans were being treated. Also while working for the NAACP, Marshall traveled to South Korea during the Cold War to further spread his political influence and fight for equality by investigating the pattern of inconsistent conviction rates for black soldiers. Culturally, Marshall grew up in a world full of discrimination, where lynching was a common day thing and a black man's inherent inferiority was publicized throughout. But Marshall was able to change some of that cultural inferiority by using his skills as a civil rights lawyer to dismantle the political system that spread and produced racial discrimination. Marshall represented civil rights plaintiffs all over the South and argued more than 30 such cases before the Supreme Court. He won all but five and earned the nickname Mr. Civil Rights. Few could bolster such a great record of achievement, but Marshall's career of public service had only begun. Marshall moved on from his work as a civil rights lawyer in 1961 when President John F. K. appointed Marshall to the U.S. Court of Appeals as a circuit judge. During his four years at that court, Marshall wrote 112 opinions which supported the rights of immigrants, limited government intrusion in cases involving illegal search and seizure, double jeopardy, and right to privacy issues. In 1965, Marshall's career took another turn when President Lyndon B. Johnson offered him the opportunity to become the first African-American Solicitor General of the United States, which he accepted. For the next two years, Marshall was the federal government's lawyer in the Supreme Court. I want you to be my Solicitor General. I want you to do it for two or three reasons. One, I want the top lawyer in the United States to represent me for the Supreme Court be a Negro, and I'd be a damn good lawyer that's done it before. Number two, uh, I think it will do a lot for our image uh, abroad and, and uh, at home, too, that, uh, that 
this is the man that uh, the whole government has to look to to decide whether it prosecutes the case or whether it goes up with the case or whether it doesn't and so on and so forth. Number three, I want you to have uh, the experience and be in the picture. Then, in 1967, another milestone occurred in Marshall's life when President Johnson appointed him as a Supreme Court Associate Justice. There was heated debate in Senate as to whether Marshall should be appointed because several Southern Senators on the Judiciary Committee strongly opposed the appointment, but a vote of 69 to 11 confirmed his nomination. Shortly after, Marshall was sworn into the Supreme Court by Chief Justice Earl Warren, making Marshall the first African American in history to sit on America's highest court. Even Martin Luther King congratulated Marshall on his appointment in a telegram, saying, It's a monumentous step towards a colorblind society. Politically, Marshall's appointment had tremendous impact on many, showing that it was possible to break racial boundaries with legislation and to use the law to uphold the equality that Marshall thought everyone deserved. Thurgood Marshall entered the Supreme Court during a very liberal time period. Marshall added to the liberal majority and found many close allies, such as Chief Justice Earl Warren, who also supported many of Marshall's liberal beliefs. Marshall's early years in the court proved to be easier as he was able to pass many of his main opinions with the majority, but as time went on, the shift from liberal to conservative started to take place. Marshall believed that everybody should have equal opportunity when it comes to justice, and this included fighting for the rights of suspected criminals. In his first opinion on the Supreme Court, which was a unanimous decision, Marshall granted criminals a right to an attorney at every stage of the criminal process. Then, after two years on the bench, Marshall wrote an important ruling in Benton v. Maryland, which protected defendants from double jeopardy in state courts, meaning that they couldn't be tried for the same crime twice. One of Marshall's most important criminal cases was Furman v. Georgia, which outlawed the death penalty. Marshall was completely opposed to capital punishment as he saw the more poor and black people were being sentenced to death for crimes that were punished for lesser sentences for rich white people. Marshall wrote in his opinion for the case, The question is not whether we condone rape or murder, for surely we do not. It is whether capital punishment is a punishment no longer consistent with our own self-respect and therefore violates the Eighth Amendment. Marshall makes it clear in his written opinion that the death penalty is not only unfair, but defies the basic principles put forward in the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits the use of cruel and unusual punishment. Marshall also fought on behalf of the mental ill during his justice career. One major victory for Marshall was in the case of Ake v. Oklahoma in 1984. In this case, a convicted murderer, Glenn Ake, appealed to the Supreme Court, arguing that his sentence should be overturned because the state had refused to pay for a psychiatrist to evaluate him. Marshall firmly argued that Ake needed the exam to prove he was insane when he committed the crime and should not be given the death penalty because of his mental problems. Marshall received support from fellow justices on the theory that the state had an obligation to make certain that every suspect got the fullest possible defense. He had won this case, a major victory for defending and fighting for the rights of the mental ill. Then, in 1986, Marshall continued his same line of argument. In Ford v. Mainwright, he contended that a murderer who was found to be insane could not be sent to the electric chair. He argued it was unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Marshall's efforts toward fighting for the mental ill were not wasted, and his impact led to justices voting against using the death penalty on the mentally ill. One part of Marshall's job was to often write the opinions in key cases. His strong opinions and impact shined through again with the case Stanley v. Georgia, where he wrote a unanimous opinion that the police were wrong to prosecute a man for, orni- for owning a pornographic film. Marshall argued that under the Constitution, the government couldn't prevent a citizen from privately watching or reading any material, including adult movies. He stated, If the First Amendment means anything, it means that a state has no business telling a man sitting alone in his own house what books he may read or what films he may watch. The significance of this case and the court's unanimous opinion established firm boundaries over which state and federal laws could criminalize private ownership of pornographic or obscene material. Marshall spent the second half of his time in the Supreme Court writing dissents against the conservative actions of the rest of the court. This can be seen in Gregg v. Georgia, which allowed states to reinstate the death penalty when they put in place guidelines for sentencing criminals to death that made an attempt to end any racial biases in execution. 
Marshall could not understand how the other justices could vote for something that he saw as cruel and unusual punishment. Marshall never backed down from his opinion and continued to write opinions on many other cases for the Supreme Court, even as his opinions began, began to agree less and less with the majority. By 1973, Marshall found himself working hard to keep the balance in the Supreme Court from shifting right into the conservative majority. During his appointment, Marshall played a key part in the Supreme Court's progressive majority that voted to uphold a woman's right to abortion in the case Roe v. Wade. He played an important role in the push for women's equality by believing that the denial of funds for abortions amounted to a violation of equal protection under the 14th Amendment. He also argued that legalized abortion was a fundamental right and that the 14th Amendment should make states pay for abortions. The debate over women's rights continued with the, when a new issue over abortion erupted in 1976. These cases, under the heading Mayer v. Roe, centered on instances in which healthy but poor women were, with normal fetuses wanted abortions and asked state governments to fund them through Medicaid. This issue struck right at the heart of Marshall's logic as to why abortion should be legal. He believed a poor woman, just as a rich woman, should be given the best possible care when making the extremely difficult choice of ending a pregnancy. This time, the increasingly more conservative court ruled against government-funded abortions for healthy women. Marshall stated, the state laws restricting abortions challenged here brutally coerce poor women to bear children whom society will scorn for every day of their lives. Continuing his support for the minorities and the underrepresented, Marshall showed his support for the poor and less fortunate in a new case where Hispanic parents sued a school district because they found affluent districts spent more money per student than in poor districts. The parents argued that the inequality in money amounted to discrimination against the minority, but despite this strong argument, the court ruled against the parents. Marshall strongly disagreed with the Supreme Court's decision, which said that poor children were guaranteed some minimal level of spending, but not equal spending to those of well-off children. Marshall argued that the disparity in spending amounted to a denial of equal protection of laws for the poor students. In 1977, another critical case appeared when a young white man, Alan Bake, sued the University of California at Davis because minority students with lower grades had been admitted to the medical school while Bake had not. The case energized Mar Marshall, and he expected to take the lead, supporting pro-affirmative action opinion. Marshall argued that the nation's legacy of slavery was still felt and that equality had not been achieved for black Americans, and that the court should view affirmative action as intending to include black people who suffered from the nation's history of racial discrimination. Marshall desperately tried to win an over enough justices' vote, but fell short, and the Bake defeat left a deep scar on the now 70-year-old justice. After defeat, Marshall stated, There's not a white man in this country who can say he's never benefited by being white. Marshall's last major battle in, Supreme, in the Supreme Court was defending affirmative action programs against a conservative majority who saw them as unequal and unfair to the white majority. A friend once called Thurgood Marshall a tea kettle about to explode, but as we have seen tonight, he appears also to have qualities of humor and patience and quiet dispassion. Underneath, there exists no doubt the tea kettle, that spirit of strong conviction that America cannot live with a free conscience until all of the people enjoy all of the fruits of America equally under the eyes of the law. In 1991, Thurgood Marshall retired from the Supreme Court after 24 years of service. Marshall's health had never been great. He battled with obesity, a smoking addiction, and alcoholism throughout his life. On January 2, 1993, Marshall died in Maryland at the age of 84. Thurgood Marshall's legacy is one that inspires many and shows the impact that one man can have on this world. Marshall's legacy caused him to win multiple awards. First, in 1992, Marshall was awarded the Liberty Medal, which is given to those who strive to secure the blessings of liberty to people around the world. Marshall was given this award to thank him for many years of fighting for equality. Second, in 1993, Marshall also won the Medal of Freedom, which is the nation's highest civilian honor, presented to individuals who have made especially admirable contributions to the security or national interests of the U.S. and world peace. Marshall was a political revolutionary of grand vision who laid the foundation for race relations in his time and for generations beyond. He continued to fight for the minorities and the voiceless throughout his entire political career, having a tremendous impact. As the Washington Afro-American editorial put it, We make movies about Malcolm X, we get a holiday to honor Dr. Martin Luther King, but every day we live with the legacy of Justice Thurgood Marshall.
carry on. It's been a long. 